thousand words, the worth of a picture. But nothing we have could ever capture our God in the flesh, who lived with us, all-knowing, all-powerful, ubiquitous. The words you said, the way you lived, for us, impossible, preposterous, wonderful, miraculous. I am the door, you told us, as you opened yourself up. I am the bread of life, you said, as you gave us your all. The light of the world, good shepherd, vine, showing us, guarding us, calling us mine. Healer, giver, lover of our souls, living water, deepest of wells, quench our thirst. You know us better, you knew us first. We worship you in spirit and truth. What's the way to the Father? What's life? What's true? It's you. The answer is you. You are all we need to survive. When your good friend died, you stood there and wept. Then you called him out and put death to death. You embody perfection, sinless and guiltless, stood in the gap and faced what was due us. No one else worthy, no other name saves, our hope for resurrection. You, yes you, Lord, conquered the grave. Well, happy Easter. happy Easter. It's great to be here with you all. I see some of y'all are still fighting your seats, and you might be feeling a little bit bad for being a few minutes late. Don't still bad. You're still way earlier than the people who did not show up today. So give yourselves credit. I do see a lot of new faces, and I want to just say, if you are a guest, if you are new here, we're so honored you decided to celebrate Easter weekend with us at the creek. Uh, some of you might have been invited by a coworker or by a neighbor or by a friend. Some of y'all are just traveling and you're from out of town and you're with family. And they said, hey, would you come to church with me? Uh, some of you might have just been driving down Franklin Road sometime over the last week or two and you saw a sign and you said, yeah, I want to I wanna go to church this weekend. No matter who you are or where you are in your spiritual journey, we are so glad that you're with us at the creek. And if we've not met yet, I'd love to introduce myself. My name is Dan Hamill. About seven years ago, my wife Karen and I, we moved to Indianapolis to be part of God's work here at the creek. And we, we honestly, we just love being a part of a church that exists to connect people to Jesus. And our hope and our prayer for you, especially if you are newer here, is that when you are in this church, that you would feel connected to Jesus, that you would sense the presence of God, that you would sense the love of God, that you would sense that God is revealing himself to you, and that you would sense that God is drawing you to himself. Now, over the last 17 weeks, as a church, we've been studying through the Gospel of John together. The Gospel of John is an account of Jesus' life and ministry. And as we've been going through this study, all along the way, we have listened to Jesus reveal the truth about his identity through these I am statements. And they are displayed visually on these paintings that are on stage. Uh, for example, we heard in John chapter 6, Jesus say, I am the bread of life. He is the one who sustains us. In John 15, Jesus said that I am the true vine. I mean, he is the ultimate source of strength and energy and wisdom and, and vitality. In John 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the ultimate path to the knowledge of God and the path to heaven. And Jesus said in John chapter 8, I am the light of the world, which means he is the one who guides us. Jesus said that I am the door, and we use doors to protect us from the elements, maybe to protect us from threats. Jesus says, I am the door. He is the one who protects his people. Jesus says in John 10, I am the good shepherd. A shepherd knows his sheep. A, a shepherd 
cares for and provides for his sheep. Jesus knows us, cares us, provides for us. And here's an image that's a little bit more abstract, but it's of a garden tomb, and the stone is being rolled away. Light is coming forth. Light is emitting from the, the grave because Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And then he went on to say, the one who believes in me will live even though they die. So there's all these incredible statements and there's a lot of, of, of image, of imagery in John's gospel comparing light and darkness. And it's fitting that we would reflect on light and darkness and how they overlap as we are just days away from the solar eclipse. A solar eclipse that happens to be hitting right here in central Indiana. We are in what the experts are calling the path of we are in the path of totality, which means that there will be people from all over the country that are flocking to our little sliver of Indiana to experience near total darkness in the middle of the day. We have not, in this part of Indiana, been in the path of totality in near total darkness since the date September 14th of the year 1205. It has been 800 years since darkness came over this part of the world for four or five minutes. But if you look at the, the biblical account, you will see that on Friday, when Jesus was hung on a cross, from noon till three, not for a few moments, but for three entire hours, not over a little sliver of the, the, the world, but over the whole earth, darkness came over everything. And there are accounts from Roman historians, Greek historians, like not people who lived in Israel, not followers of Jesus, not religious people, like just historians who say in the middle of the day, and they understood solar eclipse, they said in the middle of the day, with no cosmological explanation, it was pitch dark and you could see the stars. But the darkness that fell on that Friday was more, it was so much more than just physical. There was a spiritual reality going on. It seemed as though darkness had won, like at a far deeper level, because the man who was believed to be the light of the world was now slain, and his corpse was laid in the tomb, and the hopes of humanity were buried there with him, or so everyone had thought, which is precisely why Easter morning is the greatest turning point in the history of the world, because when Jesus he wins that victory. He comes back from the grave. He conquers sin. And he not only like claims that victory for himself, he shares that victory with everyone who follows him, with everyone who places their faith in him. And so what we want to do this Easter weekend is open up the scriptures, look at the last two chapters of the Gospel of John, and listen to an eyewitness testimony about what happened. And we're going to see that there are three different scenes to the Easter story in John's gospel. So let's go ahead and jump into scene one. Scene one, this is recorded for us in John chapter 20, and it's outside the garden tomb. So on Friday, Jesus was dead by 3 p.m. They took a spear, the Roman soldiers, they jammed it in his side, blood and water poured forth. He was entirely lifeless. They take his body down. Some of his friends asked for permission to bury him respectfully. He was wrapped in linen and burial cloths. 75 pounds of spices were put over his body to help prevent the smell of, of, of the decay. That's just how they did it back then for a person who was, who was honored. He was laid in a tomb. He was there Friday. He was there Saturday. On the third day at Sunday morning, one of his followers, a woman by the name of Mary, one of his closest disciples, went to the tomb. Now, we go to gravesides in our culture. If you have lost someone you love and you want to maybe feel close with them on the anniversary of the day that they passed or on their birthday, you want to, you want to be able to grieve and, and reflect. It's not uncommon for us to go to a cemetery and, and, and process through the, the, the grief and the loss. Here is Mary going to the tomb of Jesus to grieve and to mourn. But when she gets there, she sees something entirely unexpected. She was just going to process the loss to feel close to the man who she loved who was gone and she sees that the seal, which was guarding the tomb, had been broken. She sees that that large stone, which was covering the tomb, had been rolled away. And she is filled with a bit of uncertainty and a, a, a lot of questions. And so her instant response is to run back and tell the, the other disciples what she had seen. And at that point, two of the disciples 
Peter and John, John the one who wrote this gospel, they take off running on a dead sprint to go see what it is that Mary was talking about. And this is one of those things that I, I love is included in the Bible, is the, the interaction between John and Peter, because we know that they were young men, maybe in their late teenage years, their early 20s at this time of their lives. And you can tell there's some like, competitiveness and some banter going on between the two of them. I have been told by my close friends that I am slightly more competitive than average. And one of the things that I like to do with my competitiveness is just occasionally talk a bit of trash. But you know, the best trash talk isn't the stuff that offends someone right away. It's when it's kind of subtle, and it hits them four or five seconds later, and they're like, oh, he burned me. Well, John and Peter have this kind of relationship. They've, they've been kind of elbowing for pride of place for years now. John and Peter, they both run to the tomb, and John, who writes this letter, who, he, he writes this in the Bible for billions of people to read. He says, oh, I got there first. <laughs> he makes sure everyone knows that he's faster than Peter. And then finally he says, slow poke Peter, he comes along. And you can look now at verse 6. Then Simon Peter, finally, he came behind him. And then look, they went straight into the tomb. They want to see what happened, not just outside the tomb, but in the tomb. What did they see when they walked in? He saw that the strips of linen were lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was, was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. So the, the grave clothes were there, but Jesus' body was not. He had been arisen from the dead. That's scene one, the garden tomb. Now we move to scene two. And in scene two, we have three windows into the resurrection of Jesus. Because we're going to see that the Jesus who had left the tomb didn't go right to heaven. He came back to appear and to reveal himself to his followers. So the first window we look through is Jesus' appearance to Mary, the same Mary who went to the tomb, who saw it disturbed. The other disciples, they head back to their house. But Mary stays there. She's still in grief. Her face is still puffy. Her, her eyes are still blurry, and she's in such grief that she can't even, she can't even instantly realize that it's Jesus who shows up and is there with her, talking to her. So uh, we see in verse 15, Jesus asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? She was so filled with grief that she didn't even recognize it was Jesus, which also tells you about what her default assumption was. Her default assumption was not that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. Her default assumption was that there was a gardener there who, who like, who watched the interaction of someone breaking the tomb, and she says, like, tell me where he was laid, and I'll go and, and, and I'll find him. She assumed that someone had robbed Jesus' grave, when in reality, it was Jesus himself who had robbed the grave. But I love what Jesus says next. Jesus said to her, Mary. And the moment Jesus spoke her name, she knew who it was. She knew the resurrection had actually happened, and she falls at his feet and worships him. That's the first window that we look through. The second window, later that night, Jesus now is going to appear to the disciples. The Bible tells us that they are together in a room behind a locked door. Why are they in a locked door? Well, it's because the same people who arrested Jesus and killed him, they assume we're going to come and try to find them. So they're, they're hiding. They're in fear. Earlier that day, Mary had come and told them that she had seen the resurrected Jesus, and these male disciples basically said that she was being an emotional woman who had lost her rationality. In grief, in fear, in, in desperation, you've just kind of imagined this in your head. Get, get control of yourself. But now the disciples are there, the door is locked, and Jesus appears walking through somehow those locked doors and reveals himself to them. You can see right here in verse 20, Jesus showed them his hands and sighed. The hands where he was pierced with nails and hung to the tree. The side where the spear went through, blood and water pouring out. He shows them the proof of his resurrection. This is not a ghost. This is not some sort of vision. This was real in the flesh, an appearance of Christ, risen from the dead. And they were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Now, I said that the disciples were together, but not everyone was there. 
One of the disciples, a man by the name of Thomas, was gone during that time when Jesus showed up. Thomas, let's just assume that he was out maybe getting groceries for the crew for the next couple days so they could hang low. Well, he comes back holding, you know, eight or ten bags of groceries, and he does the secret knock on the door so the people inside know that it's someone that they can trust, and he walks in, and he puts down the Kroger bags, and he says, you guys can Venmo me your part of the groceries later, and the disciples all have like their jaws on the floor, like, Thomas, forget the groceries, forget the, the bill pay. Mary was right. Jesus is alive. Like, we saw him. Like, he was here. We know it's real. And Thomas just says, guys, you have joined Mary in her fantasy land. Until I see it with my own eyes, until I take my finger and I put it through the holes in his hands that I saw, until I can touch the side where the spear went through, I will not believe. I will not believe. This is why perhaps you have heard his name throughout history. He is known as Doubting Thomas. But now we get our third window. The Bible says it is now eight days later. So it is Monday of the following week. The disciples are together again, still behind locked doors, still afraid for their lives. Now Thomas is present. Jesus shows up again, walks through those locked doors. And instead of just talking to the, to the group of guys, he locks eyes with Thomas. And he walks right to him. And he says, Thomas, you wanted to put your finger where the holes were? Go ahead. You wanted to put your hand where the spear went through? You're welcome. Go ahead. Stop doubting, Jesus said, and believe. And at that moment, Thomas said to him, verse 28, my Lord and my God. So here you have three different groups of people, none of whom were expecting Jesus to rise from the dead, all of whom had this encounter and then fell down and worshipped. That's scene two. Now we'll move to scene three. Scene three happens sometime after those initial resurrection appearances, and we see that it's really an individual connection with Jesus and with Peter. Before Peter decided to follow Jesus and become a disciple, ultimately an apostle who would help like lead the church. He was just a regular fisherman. He went out to the lake, he caught some fish, he fed his family, he sold what was extra in the market. That's how he made his living. Now Jesus is gone. And so he goes back to what he knows. He goes back to the lake, he goes back to the boat. And in John chapter 21, we see that Jesus is, or that, that Peter is in a boat with some other fishermen and they are casting their nets. They're, they're, trying, to, they're trying to feed their families. They haven't caught anything. There's someone on the shore who says, hey, have you guys caught much? Every fisherman hates owning up to the fact that they've been skunked, but they say, no, we haven't got anything. The the person on the shore says, cast your nets to the other side of the boat. They had nothing to lose, so they cast their nets to the other side of the boat, and they, they cannot even pull the nets up. There's so many fish in them. And it was at that moment that someone in the boat realized that wasn't just a lucky tip from somebody on the shore. That's, that's Jesus. And I love what we see next. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, what did he do? He wrapped his outer garment around him. He'd probably taken off his shirt because it was so hot that day. He wrapped his clothes on him, and then what does he do? He jumps right into the water. He couldn't even wait for the boat to get to shore. He had to dive in and, and, dive in and swim into the presence of Jesus. And he gets to the shore before the other disciples who are still trying to figure out a way to get all those fish in the boat are able to make it there, which provided space and time for Peter and Jesus to have a one-on-one. And to Peter's surprise and perhaps to his initial terror, when Peter shows up to Jesus, where is Jesus standing? Not just on the shore, he's standing on the shore next to a charcoal fire. And it seems like maybe an insignificant deal, like, okay, there's a fire, okay, they're going to cook some fish, this is what you'd expect. But the only other time we see charcoal Bible, a charcoal fire mentioned any other time in the Bible is when Jesus was standing trial. He was being spat upon, he was being struck in the face, he was being condemned to death. 
And Peter is there watching on. And those nearby, standing next to the fire, warming themselves, said, Don't I recognize you? Aren't you one of his followers? Aren't you one of his disciples? And Peter said, no, it's not true. No, I don't know the man. They asked him a third time. He called down curses. He said, I swear to God, I don't know that man. I don't know him. And then the rooster crowed. He realized he had denied his Lord. And the Bible says he went outside and he wept bitterly. It was the moment of greatest shame of greatest failure, of greatest regret in his entire life, next to a charcoal fire, denying Jesus. And now he's standing in front of Jesus, risen from the dead, and he can smell it. The memory of his mistake. And what is Jesus going to say? I told you so. What is Jesus going to say? How dare you? Jesus instead says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, you know I love you. Jesus said again, Peter, do you love me? (laughs) Yes, I love you. Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? And you can see Peter's response. He's a bit exasperated. Lord, verse 17, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. But you have to realize Jesus isn't just trying to belabor a point here. You know, Jesus is not insecure relationally, needing someone to give him compliments and tell him that he's loved. Jesus is being so gracious. Jesus is being so merciful. Jesus is meeting Peter right where he was at, three times next to a charcoal fire. Peter denied Jesus, and so three times Jesus extends the invitation for him to reaffirm his love. You denied three times, now you can express your devotion three times to restore this man who had fallen. So those are the resurrection accounts. That's the Easter story told in John chapter 20 and 21. Now what I want to do with our remaining time is to jump back into each of those three scenes, put one summary word over them to package it all together, and talk about what it really means for our lives today, now 2,000 years later. So scene one, let's jump back into the garden tomb. And the word that we would put over scene one is the word rescue. The word rescue. When Jesus conquers the grave, it is the ultimate sign that he has rescued us from a battle that we were not strong enough to fight on our own. The Bible says that all of us have sinned. We have fallen short of the glory of God. We aren't just people who, who have sinned. We are, we are slaves to sins. Like We don't have the ability to overcome it on our own. The Bible says that we owe a debt because of that sin, that we do not have the resources to pay. And in Jesus conquering the grave, it is proof that the price that he paid, the sacrifice he made, was sufficient to rescue us from sin, to rescue us from darkness, to conquer the the enemy of death that we are all staring, that we can do nothing to overcome on our own. Jesus has rescued us. It says in the book of Colossians chapter 1 that he he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption. When Jesus conquers the grave, when he empties that tomb, it means that we have been rescued. It means that Jesus, seeing us in our desperation, doesn't stay far back. He doesn't send a messenger or an envoy to do the work for him. He comes himself. There's a story out of New York City from decades ago about a woman named Kitty Genovese. Kitty worked as a bartender. She was working at her store late one night and is walking home in the early hours of the morning. As she's walking home, it's just a handful of blocks from the bar to her apartment. She gets assaulted. She's mugged. And as you'd expect, someone who is unex- you know, shockingly attacked, she screams out, help, help! And the moment that she screamed, lights in the apartments nearby turn on. There wasn't like thousands of people on the streets because it was so early in the morning, but there were people on the street and they turned to look. And so the perpetrator, seeing the attention, he runs and he hides in the shadows. Like naturally, he wants to like make sure that he doesn't get caught. But then watching from the shadows, 
he sees that Kitty is still lying there, injured. And the lights that had turned on just went ahead and turned off. The people who turned to look kept on walking by. So after waiting for four or five minutes, the perpetrator went back and took that woman's life. The police who did the investigation and the reporters who followed up on it, you can see the, the headlines. 37, 37 people who saw the murder didn't call the police. And then the subtitle, apathy at the stabbing of a queen's woman. They ended up putting this account in psychological textbooks for years and years to talk about the predisposition that people have to self-preservation. Yeah, a woman was getting assaulted. Yeah, the man had a knife. If I go down, what might happen to me? Sure, I might be able to help, but what if I get stabbed? And so instead of helping, they stayed in safety. And we can hear that story in horror. We can hear that story in hope that we would do something more courageous if we were faced with it. But what we know for sure is that Jesus did the exact opposite of that story. Instead of staying in heaven, staying in a place of safety and glory, he sees us in our sin. He sees us in our depravity. He sees us with our insurmountable debt, and he comes to the rescue. He fights the battle that we could not fight. He gains the victory that we could never win and then he imparts it to us. One of the challenges that we have living in 21st century America is that we don't live in, in our headspace thinking about real enemies. We have the strongest military in the history of the world. We have two great oceans protecting us on, on either side from threats. And so not having like a true significant enemy, we make enemies of people who really probably aren't our enemies. We make enemies of our neighbors who keep their yard just their, their grass is a little bit longer than they should be they keep their trash cans out a couple more days than they should we make enemies of people on the other side of the political aisle, aisle even though we're still all citizens of the same country we, we can turn molehills in, into mountains we we make enemies of people we shouldn't right now my greatest enemy i feel like i'm facing right now are the birds in my neighborhood <laughs> may not make a lot of sense to you but where i live there are lots of birds who have recently apparently entered into a conspiracy against me to use my truck as the neighborhood bathroom. This is real. So I got this truck a couple years ago. It's like an extended cab, so it does not fit in my garage. No big deal. I'm not a prima donna. I don't have to like walk into a, a warmed up or cooled down truck. No big deal. I'll just park it in the driveway. Everything was fine for a couple years, but this spring something happened. Those birds got together. I don't know if there's a couple million of them. <laughs> what they did to the back of my truck. My, my truck has that, 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 that rhino plastic stuff on the back, which means it's got like micro texture. They pooped so much. I went to the crew car wash. I went through four times, and it's still not out. They did the special spray before I went in. The people who worked there said they had never seen a truck covered in this much feces. They had assumed that I had parked under a billboard and went on a several week trip. I was just outside of my truck. There were uh, footprints of the birds dancing on my hood. They came at me, and so I was like, all right, I see what's going on. I got on Amazon, got myself a BB gun. I said, fight fire with fire. May not have been wise, because I think the birds saw the Amazon delivery person drop it off. And this is not an exaggeration. The day they dropped it off was a Saturday. The next Sunday, I come to church. My family's at church. We're driving home. The kids in the back of the truck ask me to roll down a window so they can have the wind blowing in. Sure, no big, no big deal. Well, Dad forgot to roll up the window. Fortunately, that night, it did not rain. Unfortunately, the birds decided to go into the truck. <laughs> they defiled it. <laughs> I don't know how this battle's going to end, but the last couple days, I have been using my BB gun, okay? <laughs> the greatest battle I got going on right now is birds to protect my truck, and if that's all that we have to worry about, praise God. The truth is that we have real battles going on. We have a spiritual enemy, we have sin, we have death, death that faces us all, and Jesus comes to our rescue, 
and the empty tomb means that he is victorious and he wants to share that victory with you. Here is the second word. The second word is revelation. The Jesus who left the tomb didn't go right to heaven. He revealed himself, the Bible says, over the course of 40 days. Over those 40 days, he appeared more than a dozen times to over 500 people. And you've already read about some of the accounts. What I love about all those different revelation encounters is that each one of them was distinct. Each one of them was unique. The way he appeared to Mary was different than the disciples, different to Thomas, who needed more you know, empirical evidence, was different than even his connection with Peter, restoring him in his place of brokenness. To every person, Jesus met them right where they were at to reveal his presence and his grace and his love. And what I want to communicate today is though Jesus may not be showing up in physical form like he did in the immediate weeks following his resurrection, Jesus is still in the business of revealing himself to people. Jesus still wants to come to each individual who he made, who he knows, and who he loves and appear to them and convey his heart and his plans and his hopes to them. And he, he does it for all of us in just the way and at just the time that we need most. I think about my, my own life, and it's not a perfect template, but it, it's just like the story that I know most. When I was 12 or 13 years old, what I know for sure is I was in sixth grade. My parents had separated a couple times. My, did, my mom and dad just had some issues they couldn't resolve. They tried their best. And, but in sixth grade, mom and dad called a family meeting. We had come to expect what we would hear when these family meetings happened. And so we're learning that dad is leaving the house again. And I don't know whether it was because it was now the third time or because I was a touch older and could like, process it a bit more emotionally than I could in my elementary years. But I was just sad now. I, I was uncertain about like, how this was going to impact me and our family and, and, and just all, all the disappointment that comes from like, my dad leaving the house for good. And in the midst of, of that confusion and pain, that was the first time in my life I feel like I can say that Jesus revealed himself to me. And I think that in that moment of confusion and pain, Jesus just said, like, I see you and I know you and I'm going to protect you and your family through all of this. I can remember a time roughly 10 years later, I was in college, it was my senior year, I was getting ready to graduate. I had all the plans for my life planned out and they were exactly what I wanted. And then I had an engagement that broke off. And I remember sitting in my dorm room, on my, on my bed, in tears. And I was sad, and I was brokenhearted, and I was ashamed, and I felt like a failure. And right in that moment, I felt like Jesus revealed himself to me in that dorm room and just said, you know, I have some plans for your life that are better than your plans. Are you willing to trust me? I remember a time just five or six years ago, uh, that way, I was at Community South Hospital. I was in the maternity ward, and I got to welcome my firstborn son into the world. And I remember in the, the, the hours that followed, sitting there in that hospital room, holding my little seven-pound, seven-ounce boy, and thinking, how in the world do I love this person so much? I've never, I, I've never even thought this was possible. This is like inexplicable. This is, this is unconditional love for a person I just met. And I felt like in that moment when I was just overwhelmed with love, Jesus was revealing himself to me, saying, as much as you love this kid in ways you can't even explain or articulate, you are just now, just now beginning to scratch the surface, the very surface of the love I've had for you since before time began. I remember uh, just last year in the spring, I got a call from my sister who told me that she had found my mom who had passed away. Totally unexpected. No, no, no warning signs at all. And it was such heartbreaking news. There's five of us kids. We all got on planes. We flew back home to Denver, Colorado. We're doing the, 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 the memory 
stage of like talking about mom and putting together plans for the funeral. My, my siblings decided that mom would be most happy if, if I preached her funeral message. And so the next couple days, I went through the, 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 the grueling process of writing mom's funeral message and then standing up and preaching mom's funeral message. It's the hardest message I've ever had to write or deliver in my life. But the challenge and the, the weightiness and the, really the, 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 the internal grief of writing and preaching mom's funeral was nothing in comparison to the next day when we showed up at the cemetery. And me and my brothers got out of the car and we went to the hearse and we grabbed her casket and we walked it to a hole in the ground. And we said a few words and we read a few scriptures and we offered a few prayers. And then we watched as her body was lowered into the earth. And we put flowers and dirt over it. I think I can say it was the, the moment of greatest emotional turmoil in my entire life. The one who brought me into the world is now in a very permanent and very visceral way. That's gone. But there in that moment, standing next to my mom's grave, I felt like Jesus, in grace and in love, he just revealed himself to me again. And he spoke those words that we hear from the Gospel of John. Dan, I am the resurrection and the life. And never forget, never forget that the one who believes in me will live even though they die. Wherever you're at in life right now, I'm absolutely convinced that Jesus wants to reveal himself to you where you are at. And you might be on the peak of the mountain. Everything in life might be going just the way that you hope. You're healthy, your family is doing well, you're getting raises. Wind is at your back. If so, praise God for all of those blessings. He is there with you. Some of you are in the shadow of death. You're right there in the lowest valley. And Jesus is there with you too. Wherever he is at, wherever you are at, Jesus is alive and he is with you. And he wants to reveal himself to you in the way that you need most. In Revelation chapter three, Jesus said, here I am. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone, if anyone hears my voice and does what? And opens the door, all you have to do is open the door to your heart. I will come in and eat with them and they with me. That meal is a picture of intimacy. And Jesus wants to do that in your life. The second word is revelation. And the third word is restoration. This is the time, of course, where, where Peter sees that it's Jesus on the shore and dives into the water, grabs his clothes and just dives on in and swims to Jesus. And there, in the light of the charcoal fire, all the different interactions that Peter had had with Jesus throughout his, his life come together. You know, Peter had been there and listened to Jesus say things like, I am the light of the world. Say things like, I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. He heard him say all these things, but he didn't know what to make of it. But there in the light of the charcoal fire, it's like all of those images were finally coming together and he was beginning to see it. Peter had been there when Jesus reached out and touched the arm of the man with leprosy and his skin was restored. Peter had been there when the roof was torn apart and a paralyzed man was dropped down and Jesus just looked at him and said, my son, your sins are forgiven. And that man got up and walked. Peter was there when the woman who had spent every last dime she had on medical care trying to get better, but she only got worse, Jesus walked by and she reached out and grabbed the hem of, hem of his garment and when she touched his clothes, she was restored. Peter was there when, when Jesus walked into the room where there was a girl who had just died, 12 years old. Her parents were now heartbroken. And Jesus grabbed her hand and said, little girl, I tell you, get up. <gasps> and she took another breath and she came back to life. Peter had saw it all, but he didn't know what to make of it. But there in the light of the charcoal fire, it all came together. And he realized that this Jesus was not just a good teacher, 
who had great statements about his identity, he realized there that Jesus was not just a miracle worker who had power beyond explanation. He realized there that this Jesus is God in the flesh. What a beautiful picture he saw. And what would you expect God in the flesh to say to a man who is at the place of his greatest failure? Greatest shame, greatest disappointment, the greatest denial. What would you expect him to say? Peter was probably expecting condemnation. How could you? How dare you? Jesus just said, do you love me? He did not wag a finger. He extended a hand and said, do you love me? And that invitation to restoration is the same invitation that we are all extended today. We have all, to some extent or another, in some way or another, denied our God. But he doesn't come wanting to, like, tear down the house and start from scratch. He is a carpenter, you know. And he wants to restore us, not just to our original glory. He wants to make us better than ever before. He wants to make us a new creation. So if you are here today and you have not yet made the decision to place your faith in Jesus, to tell him, I love you and I trust you, I'm going to extend an invitation right now for you to say yes to Jesus and declare your love for him. You know what Peter did? When he saw Jesus on the shore, he just dove right into the water and swam to him. The the way the Bible tells us that we express our love for Jesus and our trust in Jesus is to be baptized. And baptism is a living picture of being joined with Jesus. When a person goes under the water, they are joining Jesus in his death. And their old life, like it dies with Jesus. And the, the water covers them. It's this picture of all of their sins being washed away. They come up out of the water and they're joining Jesus in his resurrection life. They become a new creation. And today, just like Peter, you can jump in the water and run to Jesus. You might be thinking, I wasn't prepared for this. I don't have a change of clothes. I don't have a towel. Look, we have, we have everything that you could need. We have a hundred pairs of clothes back there of, of every size. We have towels. We have a dozen changing rooms. There is no obstacle external that would be keeping you from Jesus today. If you want to come forward, we're going to, we're going to be right over here. I'm going to come down next to the baptistry, right next to these doors. And you can come and you can say, I'm ready to accept Jesus. I know we have a lot of people in our overflow rooms. If you want to just head to the back of the room, we have some pastors ready to meet you there and bring you, uh, bring you down to our primary worship center where we can do the baptism. I also want to open the doors to the porch that are over here, which is a place for prayer and for conversation. Maybe there's something weighty that you are walking through. Maybe you got a difficult diagnosis recently. Maybe you lost a loved one. You're just going through something that's hard. And a good conversation with a trustworthy person and being prayed over would make a big difference. We would love the chance to connect with you at the porch. And this is also our time for everyone to receive communion. So if you haven't already, uh, we have tables all around the worship center. And you can come and you can grab the cup which has juice and bread at the top. And we're going to have a few moments here to receive the elements and to thank Jesus for rescuing us and revealing himself to us and restoring us. If you are a follower of Jesus, you don't have to be a member of our church, but if you are a follower of Jesus, we invite you to the table to come and to receive the elements. And so right now, friends, there's several ways to respond. Everyone's welcome to communion if you're a believer. Those who would like a conversation and prayer come to the porch. I know some of you right now are ready to jump into the water and to say yes to Jesus and to declare your love for him. If that's you, it's going to take some courage. But from this point on, really to the the end of the service, you can come forward, meet us right here, and we will help you make the best, most important decision of your entire life. If you don't want to come alone, grab the person next to you. We'll do this as community. If you're ready, 